Hello, I'm Dr. Castanet. Today I'm going to uh, explain to you spondylolisthesis. Spondylolisthesis literally means spine slipping and what it refers to is the slippage of one vertebra on another and uh, I'm going to use a model to explain that. This is a model of two vertebrae in the low back. You can have spondylolisthesis anywhere in the spine between any two segments in the spine, but probably the most common place is in the low back and then the second most common place would be in the neck. What happens is that um, the vertebrae, here's one above, one below, are connected to each other with a number of ligaments. There's uh, one in front here, there's one in back there, there's one in between the lamina here, there are some between the spinous processes, there are some that make up the joint capsule. There are some deep in here between the spinous processes and back here between the spinous processes. Uh, so there, and, and of course the ligamentous tissues that make up the disc itself. So there are a number of ligamentous tissues that hold the vertebrae in their appropriate position. There are a couple of reasons that slippage of two vertebrae can occur. One is as a result of stress and trauma to this part typically of the spine that I have marked here with the line right there. Uh, this part right here of the bone is the part between the joint here and below here. So we call this the pars, meaning part, inter, meaning between, articularis, meaning the joints. So you can damage the pars interarticularis as a result of a stress fracture, we think, typically, that occurs in childhood or during teenage years. It may be present on one side or it may be present on both sides. If you have a defect here, and if it's severe enough, it will then fail to restrain the front part of the vertebrae from sliding forward on the back part of the vertebra. Uh, we grade the severity of the slip in terms of um, grade one, two, three, or four, depending on whether it's fallen forward one quarter of the way, half of the way, three quarters of the way, or all the way off of the one below. So you could conceivably get a vertebra that slips forward like that, a quarter of the way, or half the way, or three quarters of the way, or all the way off the one below. I'll pull that up. So it could actually be like that. When that happens, the holes here in the vertebrae that are supposed to line up so that the nerves can pass through that hole, they don't line up any longer. And when that happens, the nerves have to pass down one hole, then they have to snake back to get down to the next hole. If there's too much slippage, there's going to be tension on the nerve roots as they come down and try to snake their way back and down the next hole. That can be a source of pain, and that pain would likely be felt in the distribution of the nerves, where the nerves run, which means in the low back, down the buttock, thigh, leg, or foot. You could get problems on one side or both sides. There are occasions when that slippage, depending on how severe it is and how, how symptomatic it is, these vertebrae may have to be surgically be placed back together uh, and then jacked back up because typically when the vertebrae slide, slides forward like that, it will damage the disc below and over time that shear force will destroy the disc so that it collapses. So the vertebrae not only have to be pulled back into the proper position, but jacked up as if the disc were still there and fused in that position. That's a surgery that when necessary has a very good prognosis because uh, it can result in significant symptoms. The cause of the pain is typically Easy, easily known and it uh, has a ready fix surgically. Uh, that's in a very small percentage of these slip cases. A more common slip happens as a result of degenerative changes to the joints. The joints are responsible for maintaining the relationship between the vertebrae and restraining slippage forward of one on the other. If the joints become incompetent as a result of degenerative changes, 
they will permit one vertebra to slip forward on another. That is a very common phenomenon. I probably see that in 7% of older spines, 7 to 10% of older spines. It's usually a modest slip. It's usually part of the degenerative process and uh, it may just be an incidental finding and a red herring, so to speak, meaning not the cause of the pain and not um, unamenable to improvement through conventional treatment, whatever that may be. In my experience, um, for these degenerative slips, whether they're grade one and even up to grade two, perhaps, they are amenable to improvement through treatment as if they didn't exist because there are lots of sources of pain and you treat um, any other potential source of pain and that slip is not an impediment to improving the spine and to get the person's pain reduced and their, dis their ability back. So I typically treat a problem like that the way I would most problems of a degenerative nature in the low back. I place them on a table. It's called a spinal decompression table. I open up the joints and the vertebrae to get more water, oxygen, and nutrients into the disc. That alleviates pain that is uh, coming from any one of the typical pain generators, meaning the disc, nerve, or joint. If you do that, most people will get relief. The slip remains intact because these slips are typically uh, stable, meaning they slip forward but stay in that position. So they may or may not be a source of pain. Uh, I do think that it makes for a biomechanical vulnerability and it is a likely source of pain. But it turns out that if you treat these people, you don't have to correct the slip to get them feeling better. That's probably true 85% of the time. There's a small percentage of patients that will benefit from an injection if the uh, spinal decompression treatment does not suffice. And there are some tiny percentage of people that need surgical treatment for this. Uh, the important point is to do the appropriate treatment for the person, starting with the more conservative and then progressing, if needed, to injections and lastly to surgical treatment. Uh, whatever the treatment is, whether it's non-surgical, injections, surgical, uh, the appropriate treatment in the right patient at the right time for the right problem is typically a blessing. And the trick is, as a clinician, to be um, aware of all the available treatments, to know when to use which, to start with the most conservative, and proceed accordingly as needed. The unfortunate fact is, though, um, that the prevailing means of treatment ignores effective non-surgical treatment. I've uh, been in orthopedics uh, for 18 years, physical therapy and physical medicine for 18 years, and spent four years part-time in a neurosurgical practice. So I think I am very familiar with the surgical and non-surgical treatments when each is indicated. And I can tell you that unfortunately the most effective non-surgical treatment for degenerative conditions of the spine, including spondylolisthesis, is ignored, and that is spinal decompression treatment. Uh, the reason spines hurt is almost always because of um, insult on the three pain generators, discs, nerves, and joints. If you treat those by decompressing the spine, because compression is the underlying theme of all of the different lesions you might cite in the spine on an x-ray or MRI scan, if you treat the compressive cause of the pain, whether or not you have spondylolisthesis, the patient's pain typically gets better and you can avoid injections and surgical treatment. If I can help you with your problem, please give me a call. I'm Dr. Castanet. The phone number is 404-558-4015. I'm in Decatur, Georgia, inside the perimeter, and I service uh, people from throughout the Atlanta metro area and greater Georgia area as well. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.